We are right at 421, so I will gavel us back in the open session, turn this back over to Rudy. Okay, we're gonna to have to, we're gonna to attempt to change the order of things here to accommodate people's end of day schedule. So Maya and uh, Greta, are you on the call? Yes, we are. Thank would, you so much. Would you guys be willing to give your presentation now? Yes, happy okay. to do that. Okay, so a, a brief introduction here. We have four working groups of the council. Last September, you heard for genomic, from Genomics and Society Working Group. And we have three additional working groups that are all gonna give a report today. It's part of their requirement is to present to the entire council. So we're gonna begin with the Community Engagement Working Group. And Maya Sabatello and Greta Goto are co-chairs of that group. And they're gonna share this presentation. Maya, are you leading off? Uh, Greta is. Greta and is. And she's got the slides. She will lead on with the slides as well. Thank you. Great. Very good. All right. Take it away. All right. I'm going to share a screen, Rudy. Are you seeing slides? Yep. One very second. good. Perfect. Well, thank you uh, for the time on your agenda this afternoon. We are very honored. Maya and I are very honored to be with you today to share an update about the Community Engagement and Genomics Working Group. And we're very happy to share some of the activities that we've been working on since we met with you uh, the last time in 2021. I can't believe it's already been that long. Uh, as a brief recap, especially for some of the newer members on the advisory council, the Community Engagement and Genomics Working Group, um, or SEGWEG, or Working Group, is supported by staff from both the Education and Community Involvement Branch and the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity Office. And we want to give a special shout out and thank you to uh, Larry Brody and to Vince Bonham for all of their support and work with us um, on this on this uh, uh, very exciting um, group that gets to work with each other. Our mission is to facilitate understanding and information between community and NHGRI. It is our hope that you'll see this mission is alive and well in the work that we'll be reporting on today. Yep. Thank you, Greta. So, you know, in the previous, some of the goals that we've had in the past, these are the goals generally for our committee. Um, and since we reported last in September of 2021, we've continued to work on the last three goals, uh, which are sort of giving some input about NHGRI activities uh, and their ability to reach all communities and to increase genomic literacy, partnership with NHGRI to build trust with communities, and then the third big goal was to collaborate with other uh, communities and EGRI and other institutes and centers uh, that have uh, uh, a synergy here. And then we'll also share a little bit about the work that we're doing with regards to the first two goals, which are to assess the gaps and needs of diverse communities related to genomics and genomic medicine, as well as to develop programs and disseminating tools and resources to address identified gaps and needs. The next slide, please. Thank you. So we just want to briefly reintroduce ourselves to you too, especially since there are some new members on the advisory council. Chamai, Huinga Atka, Greta Anderson Goto, Tuliung Yun Yunga. My name is Greta Goto, and I am working and living on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascan in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm originally from Tuliung or Dillingham, Alaska, which is in Bristol Bay. My professional experience includes nonprofit and business administration community outreach, research and project development, strategic planning, and board work. I became involved with genetics uh, when our older daughter was diagnosed with prader willi syndrome almost 26 years ago. Uh, and I've advocated for her and others who have rare diseases, and that has, what led, has led me here to the Segway group, and I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity to serve. Maya? Thank you so much. Um, I'm Maya Sabatello. I'm an associate professor of medical sciences at the Center for Precision Medicine and Genomics and Division of Ethics at Columbia University, where I'm also serving as the co-chair of the Precision Medicine, Ethics, Politics, and Culture Project, which aims to increase the dialogue, the inter interdisciplinary dialogue about precision medicine research. My own work focuses on uh, disability inclusion and trust in precision medicine research. Uh, I have had um, more than two decades work with the disability community broadly defined, and I'm also a member of that community for quite a few years now. Um, 
without happy notes, we can move to introduce also our members. Um, Greta. Thanks, Maya. So we have 12 regular members and one ad hoc member. Membership on this working group is for two years and can be extended. We currently have two open seats that will be, will be filled in the next months. This year as well, we'll have a couple of members that need to rotate off. Their current membership um, includes Becca Bacall from the Sinai Urban Health Institute in Chicago, Kellen Baker with the Whitman Walker Institute in Washington, DC, Gwen Darian with the National Patient Advocate Foundation in Washington, DC and New York, Gregory Diggs Yang with the Cal University of California, Irvine, Brittany Hollister with the University of Florida Genetics Institute, and I, I think some of you will recognize her name. Alma McCormick with the Messengers for Health with the Crow Tribal Nation in Montana. Ella Green Moten the, with the Community Ethics Review Board in Flint, Michigan. Alicia Santiago from the National Science Foundation. And Michael Hahn, who's a tribal engagement lead at NIH for the All of Us Research Program. In addition, the working group is regularly supported by NIH, NIH staff, Christina Dalton, who is the Partnership and Engagement Officer in the Training, Diversity and Health Equity Office, and Belen Hurley, who is an Associate Investigator in the Division of Intramural Research. Other members of the NHGRI Education Policy Branch also participate in our calls and help support our work. And those include Donna Messersmith and Roseanne Wise, and then also from the Office of Communications, Sarah Bates and Julia Fekas. And we thank all of them for their help and support. So in our previous reporting uh, period, we shared with you two papers that we worked on uh, at the time with the working group and which both focused on structural racism and discussions in the context of genomics and precision medicine research. That experience of writing two, um, two papers together really gave us a taste for maybe more. And one of the themes that came out of it is the importance of intersectionality. So since then, we've taken on two additional papers, which are now uh, working titles here and we're finalizing the first one, which is on the need for intersectionality framework in precision medicine research. Um, and the second paper is still underway and hope to be finalizing that as well soon. Um, and it which focuses on distrust in genomic medicine, the need for an intersectional lens. And again, it looks into some of the issues that might come up um, and um, in how an intersectional framework may mitigate um, some of the challenges that patients are under are going through. So what is intersectionality? And Greta, if you can please do best of the next slide. So intersectionality is a framework for understanding and analyzing how multiple categories of sociopolitical identities shape and substantiate one another and how systems of power and privilege create and maintain lived experiences of marginalization. It originated by women of color during the 1960s and 70s and coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. It has several tenets that were particularly appealing for us as a committee. Uh, the first one is that it views multiple overlapping sociopolitical identities as mutually constituted, not additive. That is that the experiences of various isms, such as racism, sexism, ableism, and so forth, intersect, co-create, and substantiate one another. A second tenet of the intersectionality framework is that uh, the intersectional research is inherently connected with how systems of power and privilege influence lived experiences, create oppressed and marginalized populations, and inform the conceptualization of sociopolitical identities. And finally, this framework um, is geared towards social justice and aims to identify actionable solutions. So both our papers take on to highlight how intersectionality is important and can be informative for respectively precision medicine research and clinical genomic medicine. Uh, with the latter paper on genomic medicine, actually also including a decision tree uh, as an educational resource for readers and for clinicians to guide more equitable genomic care. Next slide, please. Our second uh, or third sort of second big project that we're focusing on aside from the papers 
uh, is a work to think about, um, it's, it's a community outreach concept mapping effort. And this project is aimed to identify communities that should be engaged by NHGRI and or those communities that need more opportunities to engage with NHGRI. Uh, this topic has come up in many of our meetings and in discussions with leadership at NHGRI as well. Um, and the overarching questions and purpose of these questions included, uh, what does um, our committee know about which communities need more opportunities to hear from NHGRI and the other way around? As well as given NHGRI's mission, how should the Institute partner to expand the reach of NHGRI to those communities that haven't received as much attention to date? And how might our com committee help NHGRI think about how the Institute engages different communities? How can we make it in a way that is responsive to the community needs? So we've taken on a concept, um, a mapping visual exercise, if you will, which kind of builds on a research method that's called concept mapping. But here we're doing just the brainstorming part of it, of actually trying to identify together the, those missed communities and the ways that we can approach them. So the prompts that you can see on the slide are essentially the quick questions that we've had asked the community members in a meeting, in meetings, and it's an iterative process. So we started with one community that NHGRI should approach is, and everyone is responding, was res responded to that, followed by one sub-community that NHGRI should bring attention to is. And a part of the idea is, of course, that also within communities, they're never, they're never homogenous. If we're looking into African-American communities, they're not one single voice. There's so many intersections within them. So um, we wanted to look into those intersections, the sub-communities within the larger community. And then the ways that NHRI can approach these communities uh, is, and again, trying to get more responses to that. And I'll say beforehand that, you know, we'd be happy to hear more prompts if that might be helpful. We're still in the process of fleshing out some of the details, of thinking about the, 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 the little little things that we still want to move forward, what we're missing, and again, thinking how to move forward with that. Next slide, please. So following on what Maya just described, um, some of the responses that we got, not some, the responses that we did get from our, our community uh, working group was looking at um, all of these different communities, and we're looking at it under the umbrella of medically underserved. Um, you might recall that the U.S. Health Services Administration designates medically undeserved as, as areas or populations that have too few primary care providers, high infant mortality rates, high poverty, or a high elderly population. So we believe using the medically underserved as kind of our overarching umbrella in, in this instance um, as an approach can reach a large number of the people and communities that we're talking about. And, and really looking at intersectionality as the lens through which we're, we're identifying this. In our preliminary results, the working group identified several communities such as um, African-American Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, people with disability, Native Hawaiians, immigrants, homeless, limit, individuals with limited English proficiency, inner city, LGBTQIA+, mixed race, bicultural, rare disease, rural, Native Hawaiians and persons living in US territories. Again, our group believes that mapping this can help illustrate the intersectionality complexities and underscore the need to work with patients within a community on a one-on-one -on -one basis and get to know them and their needs. So we're hoping we're going to share three examples of the working visuals that we're designing uh, based on the results of the working group discussions. Um, and again, we'd welcome suggestions. The first uh, work that we want to share is about people with disabilities. Um, now, of course, people with disabilities is one of these um, cross, a universal phenomenon that cuts, cuts across all other demographic categories. Um, and so what we're trying to, first of all, convey is that we're thinking about people with disabilities. We're thinking about diverse sub-communities within the disability community, including those with genetic as well as those with non-genetic causes of disability. Uh, we're looking at communities with diverse issues of identity or medical needs. And we're looking at those intersections, again, with race, age, gender, ethnicity, and these are some of some of the intersections that exist. I will say that, of course, although um, disability is a universal phenomenon, there's far higher prevalence of disability among um, marginalized racial and ethnic as well as gender groups because of structural racism and discrimination. Um, so that was kind of the initial 
uh, mapping that we, we wanted to think about. And then from those little sub-communities that we were thinking about, we tried to think about what are the ways in which NHGRI can be um, more involved in including and engaging the community. So first thing is to think about inclusive studies requiring data um, collection about disability studies that is usually not uh, not, not in existence in most studies, but also creating studies that follow principles of universal design, ensuring that they are accessible and inclusive of all participants, and trying to think about the idea that we can exclude participants, not just directly by telling them that not eligible, but actually by ensuring that we're, that we're not excluding them indirectly by simply not making studies accessible to them. We also wanted to highlight the need for researchers um, to have disability cultural competency and the idea that we have to learn to speak the language that many people with disabilities prefer use and find not offensive. Um, we have the not, um, in addition to think about how do we train and develop workforce that is diverse, uh, both in terms of, again, training researchers, training the, the existing workforce for that diversity, but also uh, thinking about how do we increase the workforce of people with disabilities as researchers, which is something that, um, that is still a little bit behind. Um, and then in, th in terms of researchers, you know, thinking about how can they start approaching to those disability communities, I think one of the key issues that comes up in my research for sure, but in other conversations with those communities, is the need for personal contact, really the question of trust, how do we build that trust, and how do we make sure that we're implementing trust, uh, trustworthy steps in every step of the research design, planning, implementation, and so forth. And then thinking about where do we want to meet to those communities, whether it is in research settings or in other non-clinical and research settings, which actually might be more accessible for members of that community. Next slide. So our next example of a community that NHGRI should approach is the LGBTQI community. I want to credit uh, Kellen Baker for providing this well-rounded information for us, and I, and I hope I can do it justice. Um, so looking at the LGBTQI community as a whole, kind of following along the example that Maya just, just presented, some of the, the sub-communities under this larger community would include transgender, people with intersex variations, and same-sex parents. And again, then those larger intersectionalities would include people of color, age, socioeconomic status, limited or non-English speakers, those that live in rural areas or that have disabilities. That's the intersectionality piece and where things can get very complicated very quickly. But like Maya also said, approaches to align um, these intersectionalities with this larger community and the sub-communities and approaches to working with these different communities, NHGRI could work with the ISCC PEG to develop and publish resources for genome.gov could also host a symposium on LGBTQ issues in genomic research and medicine, or push for the collection of sexual orientation, gender identity and variations in sex characteristics data on studies that are supported by NHGRI. And finally, NHGRI could require that its supported studies also include these populations to, or to justify why they might be excluded. The third community or third example that we want to provide is uh, illustrating approaches to indigenous communities. And I think it's important here that we don't forget that um, indigenous communities can include those that are coming to our country from other countries and immigrant status or, or as being um, persecuted in their own home countries. So as one example of a sub-community within indigenous communities, um, we could look at the 574 US federally recognized tribes. Now that, that's a big mouthful there and one tribe within the 574 might require a different type of approach and, and um, just because of cultural uh, differences among the tribes. A general approach, again, recognizing these tribes with those intersectionalities that we've already discussed around language, homelessness, being an urban or a rural uh, uh, community member of a tribe, two-spirit, if you're mixed race or bicultural, if you have other disease that might be going on, um, and whether or not you might be a first language speaker. 
And in this preliminary review, um, what we got back from our community engagement working group was that kind of really looking at the researchers first. Um, and one of the, the big, one, one area where our, our um, working group reflected on is how might a researcher approach a community? And initially reaching out via personal contact to either the Indian Health Service clinic or a tribal clinic on the reservation to ask if a genomics research project is something that that community might feel important or beneficial to their members. If the clinic personnel are interested, then they could identify a community liaison within that community, someone that the community members feel is trustworthy, that has established integrity and is knowledgeable of the culture. And I think we heard a little bit about that earlier with um, uh, uh, Dr. McCartney in her presentation with Dr. Green. So finally, the community liaison would take a lead to guide the approach that would be most culturally respectful and appropriate. And one of the big recommendations is that the researcher actually go out into the community in person to establish rapport and a relationship with, with the people before sharing any information about genomics. And I think um, you can kind of see across these different approaches that there are some, some pretty significant similarities. Maya, do you want so, to wrap up our that project? Yep. Yes. So in wrapping up our report, we wanted to share also some of the outreach and collaborations that members of our committee have been involved with. Um, some of them have been mentioned in today's conversation already, uh, but again, our members of the committee have the opportunity and honor to be on some of them, and we're really uh, grateful for that. So Gwen Darian, Kellen Baker, and Greta Gatto were all presenters at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and um, and medicine workshop on realizing the potential of genomics across the continuation of precision health care. Ella Green Moton was elected to be the president of the American Public Health Association. Um, I was involved uh, to in, in the ASHG's um, development of the guidance on community engagement, as well as uh, at the NHGRI Symposium on Disability and Genomics. Um, and both Ellen, Kellen Baker and I um, are also members of the NHGRI uh, ISCC PEG, and we're both uh, co-chairs of different groups. Uh, Kellen is leading a working group on uh, gender identity and equity, and I'm working with Shemita uh, Deskupta on um, disability bias in the project inclusion as well. Next slide, please. So, this is just our contact information, uh, as well as, again, shout out again to our awesome legends, Christina and Bellin. And we want to thank you for the time and efforts uh, to Shepherd and Stuart, and Stuart the committee, uh, its members, and our work. Next slide, please. We do want to acknowledge and pay special tribute to our dear colleague and friend, and long time working group member, Mary Jackson Scroggins, who passed away last year. Um, the working group will be dedicating our work this year, our papers on intersectionalities to her and in memory of her good work. And we really appreciated the opportunity to meet her as part of this working group as well. Next slide, please. So I just want to thank uh, Greta here for passing along the slides. Uh, thank you everyone, the council members and the leadership of NHGRI for your time and allowing space in the agenda to share our work with you this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the support in our work. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Our thanks to both of you for that presentation. Uh, council, do you have any questions for either of the co-chairs? All right, Maya and oh, Vince. Oh, Iftikhar. I, I just wanted to uh, express my gratitude for all the work that's being done. I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. And um, I think some of the resources you listed would be very useful for those of us who might be contemplating engaging with <clears throat> minority populations. Um, I think the recent ASG document I thought was uh, very useful. Uh, uh, that's just come out, I think, in the last couple of months. So I, I think it's such an incredibly important area for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Or you were, okay. All right, great. Oh, Laura, please. Yes, I also 
want to say thank you for all this work and just um, you know how I'm not sure I want to kind of ask the question in general which is um, you know there's MCATS which is a lot of community engaged research also and how can we leverage everything that's happening with the CTSAs um, to help with the genomic research also? You know that's a great question and I think um, you know when I think we're planning to have an in-person meeting in May, and I think we can definitely add that to the agenda in terms of even meeting with the leads perhaps of NCAT and again, trying to think about synergies and collaborations. Um, that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Gerald, can I have the larger screen to see if others have questions? Thank you. Okay, Maya and Greta, thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to develop this presentation for Council. Thank, thank you. you.